Hi guys, Dr. Scott Cleos here, and today we're going to briefly review the signs and symptoms of stroke. A little over a year ago, we did a short presentation on the difference between a primary and comprehensive stroke center. Regardless of their designation, the primary objective of any stroke center is to reduce the severity of a stroke event with rapid diagnosis and treatment. Remember, an embolic stroke is caused by an obstruction of a blood vessel growing to the brain. This is usually due to a small clot that breaks off from the heart or the vessels in the neck, travels up the bloodstream, and lodges in a small vessel going to the brain. The traveling piece of clot is called an embolus. Once blocked by the embolus, the brain cells closest to the obstructed vessel die within minutes. This is called the core infarct. However, the cells just outside the core infarct can receive a small amount of blood from other vessels in the head which can keep the cells alive but can't supply enough nutrients and oxygen to keep them functioning. The parts of the body controlled by these oxygen and nutrient starved brain cells won't work during the actual stroke, but function can return to normal if the main blood supply is restored quickly. This area is called the penumbra, and salvaging the penumbra or nutrient starved brain cells is the key to effective stroke therapy. Unfortunately, the longer it takes to remove the clot, the more brain cells die at an estimated rate of 32,000 cells a second or 1,900,000 cells every minute. The stagnant blood behind the embolus begins to clot, cutting off the blood supply to other territories in the brain and extending the core infarct over time. In a primary stroke center, the doctors can administer a clot-busting medicine in your veins called TPA or tissue plasminogen activator. A naturally occurring chemical secreted by the blood vessels of our own bodies, TPA can break up the fresh clot that has recently formed behind the embolus and possibly reduce the size of the core infarct. Unfortunately, TPA probably won't have any effect on the actual embolus blocking the vessel since this has usually formed over weeks, months, or years in the heart or neck and TPA has no real effect on these chronic or mature pieces of clot. However, the Comprehensive Stroke Center has equipment and physicians that may be able to help. A catheter and wire are inserted into the groin and with x-ray guidance are then manipulated into the blocked blood vessel of the brain. Once in place, the embolus can be literally sucked out of the vessel with the catheter connected to a vacuum pump, restoring blood flow within minutes. But all this only works if it's done quickly before the brain is irreversibly damaged. Therefore, it's imperative that you recognize the earliest signs of a cerebral vascular blockage so you can get to the closest comprehensive stroke center, receive appropriate therapy, and minimize the impact of a potentially devastating or deadly stroke. This is an MRA or magnetic resonance angiogram of the main vessels of the brain in an actual patient. As a reference, a 3D model of the brain is displayed to the left, consisting of two main parts. The higher brain, or cerebrum, is the largest part of the brain and controls or processes advanced functions such as limb movement, sensation, thoughts, speech, personality, and vision. The smaller hindbrain, or primitive brain, includes the cerebellum, pons and brainstem, which all control more basic functions such as coordination, heart rate, and spontaneous respirations. As you can see, there are a total of four vessels traveling through the neck up to the brain, two in the front and two in the back. As such, the two forward neck vessels, called the carotid arteries, and the intracranial vessels they supply are part of the anterior circulation, whereas the two posterior neck vessels, called the vertebral arteries, and the intracranial vessels they supply are part of the posterior circulation. There are three major sets of paired vessels in the brain. Starting from the front, these are appropriately called the anterior cerebral arteries, middle cerebral arteries, and posterior cerebral arteries. In most individuals, the anterior and middle cerebral arteries are supplied predominantly from the carotids in the front of the neck. In the back of the neck, the vertebral arteries join together to form a singular vessel called the basilar artery. Oftentimes, one vertebral is congenitally larger than the other. 
our patient is right vertebral dominant. Branches off of the basilar supply the critical structures of the primitive brain, including the pons, brainstem, and cerebellum, which collectively control basic autonomic functions such as breathing, digestion, heart rate, blood pressure, and coordination. The terminal branch of the basilar artery are the two posterior cerebral arteries, which supply the occipital lobe or far posterior portions of the higher brain or cerebrum. Finally, at the base of the brain, there is a collection of horizontal vessels that connect the paired anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries, collectively referred to as the circle of Willis. The single anterior communicating artery connects the two anterior cerebral arteries. The A1 segment of the anterior cerebral arteries connect the anterior cerebral arteries to the middle cerebral arteries, and the two posterior communicating arteries connect the middle cerebral arteries to the posterior cerebral arteries. The two P1 segments of the posterior cerebral arteries connect the basilar artery to the posterior cerebral arteries. This circle of vessels ensures some redundant flow to the critical vessels of the brain in case one of the neck vessels becomes occluded or damaged. However, the components of the circle are quite variable, and unlike this particular patient, the circle is often congenitally incomplete. Now, to recognize the earliest signs and symptoms of a stroke, we need to know two things. Number one, the details of what parts of the brain control what functions of the body, also known as the cytoarchitecture of the central nervous system. And number two, which vessels supply oxygen and nutrients to the various areas of the brain, also known as the vascular territories. Let's start with the cytoarchitecture or brain mapping. Starting with the basics, there is a left and right cerebral hemisphere. In general, The left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and vice versa. The cerebral cortex is divided into four major regions or lobes, including the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and occipital lobe. We can further define the cytoarchitecture of the brain using various models, one of which is the cortical homunculus. Homunculus literally means little man or little humanoid, and our cortical homunculus is a dysmorphic little humanoid whose body parts are drawn proportional to the relative amount of brain that is dedicated to their function or sensation. As you can see, a lot of brain cells are dedicated to our senses, including the eyes, nose, lips, tongue, and hands. The drawing to the left delineates the general brain regions that control sensation and movement of their respective body parts. The lower leg is draped over the medial aspect of the parietal lobe, with the trunk and outstretched upper limb hanging over the convexity. A large portion of the lower parietal lobe is dedicated to the sensation and movement of the structures of the face, including the eyes, nose, mouth, and tongue. Importantly, though, the sensory input from all of these structures are actually processed in other areas of the brain, which will be important when we talk about vascular territories in a moment. Below the sylvian fissure, the temporal lobe is predominantly involved in processing auditory stimuli, memory, and emotions. Based on regional anatomic variations and structure, Dr. Corbinian Broadman, a German neurologist and anatomist, proposed a cortical map of brain function in the early 20th century that now bears his name. There are 52 Broadman areas in each cortex, the function of which have been revised and fine-tuned over the past century. For instance, a region of the brain known as Broca's area corresponds to Broadman's areas 44 and 45 and is critical in speech production. Damage to this area makes it difficult or impossible for the affected patient to produce coherent sentences in their native language, also known as an expressive aphasia. Wernicke's area in the posterior temporal parietal region corresponds to portions of Broadman's areas 22, 39, and 40, and is the region of the brain involved in the interpretation of speech. Damage to this area prevents the patient from understanding spoken words in their native language, also known as a receptive aphasia. Most of the time, both Broca's and Wernicke's areas are located in the dominant left cerebral hemisphere. Dominance is usually associated with handedness, so right-handed people will generally be left brain dominant, and left-handed people right brain dominant. In right-handed individuals, Broca's and Wernicke's are located in the left cerebral hemisphere 95 to 99% of the time. However, Left-handed people still have Broca's and Wernicke's in the left cerebral hemisphere 60% of the time, with only 40% showing true right brain dominance housing Broca's and Wernicke's in the right cerebral hemisphere. Finally, I want to point out Broadman Area 17, also known as the visual cortex. Interestingly, the visual information received by our eyes on the front of our faces is actually processed in the occipital lobes all the way in the back of our brains. 
We'll go into some more detail in a moment when we discuss vascular territories in the posterior circulation. Now that we have a generalized mapping of the cerebral cortex, if we look at the distribution of the vascular territories of the brain, we can predict which neurologic deficits we would expect to see with various vascular occlusions. Let's start with the anterior circulation, which includes the anterior and middle cerebral arteries. The middle cerebral artery is the largest branch of the internal carotid artery and supplies the lateral, parietal, temporal, and posterior frontal lobes, the anterior tip of the entire temporal lobe, as well as the subcortical nuclei of the basal ganglia. Looking back at our cortical homunculus, we can see that an embolus to the middle cerebral artery will primarily affect motion and sensation in the upper body, head, and face on the opposite side from the affected cortex. Again, the left brain controls the right side of the body and vice versa. These patients will show upper extremity paralysis, facial droop, and general neglect of the affected side. There may be relative sparing of the lower extremity, however. Remember, if the affected side is the dominant hemisphere, Broca's and Wernicke's areas may be compromised, causing the patient to lose the ability to produce and understand speech, respectively. Now let's look at the anterior cerebral artery. For clarity, we'll remove the left-sided middle cerebral artery. As you can see, the distribution of the anterior cerebral artery predominantly feed the medial aspect of the cerebral hemisphere, as well as the anterior frontal lobe and the high convexity of the parietal cortex. The far anterior frontal lobes are predominantly associated with judgment, impulse control, and behavior. Looking again at our cortical homunculus, we can see that the high convexity of the parietal lobes controls motor and sensory function of the chest, trunk, and lower extremity. As such, we would expect isolated lesions of the anterior cerebral artery to predominantly affect behavior as well as motor function of the lower extremity. Finally, I want to look at the posterior circulation in some detail. As recognizing the early signs of embolic disease to this particular vascular territory may prevent a catastrophic stroke if treated early. Let's remove the entire anterior circulation and again review the relevant vascular anatomy. The inflow to the posterior circulation is provided by the vertebral arteries, often asymmetric in diameter, but depicted in this graphic as codominant. The two vertebral arteries join together to form the singular basilar artery, which travels directly in front of the pons and midbrain. Multiple perforator branches off of the basilar supply these critical structures of the primitive brain which control breathing, blood pressure, heart rate, and digestion. There are three paired vessels in the posterior circulation that provide blood flow to the cerebellum beginning inferiorly with the posterior inferior cerebellar arteries, or pica, which arise from the vertebral arteries themselves. The anterior inferior cerebellar arteries, or aica, arising from the proximal basilar, and the superior cerebellar arteries, or SCA, arising from the distal basilar artery. The cerebellum coordinates voluntary muscular movement and is therefore instrumental in posture, balance, coordination, and articulate speech. The terminal branches of the basilar artery are the most posterior arteries of the higher brain, appropriately called the posterior cerebral arteries, or PCAs. These vessels supply blood flow to the occipital lobes as well as portions of the temporal lobes. So again, the posterior circulation provides blood flow to the most critical portions of the primitive brain that basically keeps us alive and coordinated. But the terminal branches, the posterior cerebral arteries, supply the occipital lobe as well as a small portion of the infralateral and the majority of the medial temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is involved with emotion and memory, and the occipital lobe predominantly processes visual stimuli, especially in the aforementioned Broadman Area 17, or the visual cortex. Compromise of the occipital flow may give us an early sign of trouble with the posterior circulation if we know what to look for. This wonderful illustration, provided by my friends at KenHub, shows the entire optic pathway from the eyes to the visual cortex of the occiput. Light enters the eyes through the lens, and is projected on the retina posteriorly where the light is converted into an electrochemical signal. That electrochemical information travels from the optic nerves of each eye, passes through the optic chiasm just above the pituitary gland, and then travels through the optic tract to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. From the lateral geniculate nucleus, optic radiations carry the visual signal to the visual cortex or Broadman area 17 of the occipital lobes.
Now, what's important when talking about the signs and symptoms of stroke is which parts of the visual field are processed by which parts of the visual cortex. Going back to the eyes, let's concentrate on the colored panels depicting the visual fields. Looking up from the feet, this is the right and left sides of the face respectively, and therefore, the blue panel represents the right visual field and the purple, the left visual field. Starting with the right visual field, or blue panel, light enters both lenses with the blue projecting on the medial side of the right retina and the lateral side of the left retina. That signal travels through the optic nerves of each eye, and at the chiasm, the lateral signal from the left eye continues down the left optic tract and the medial signal from the right eye crosses the chiasm and also travels down the left optic tract to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. At this point, all the light signal from the right visual field is now being carried by the left optic tract and lateral geniculate nucleus. The signal then continues down the optic radiation to the occiput, where the information from the right visual field is processed and interpreted by the left visual cortex as depicted by the blue shading of Broadman Area 17. Similarly, the purple left visual field projects onto the medial retina of the left eye and the lateral retina of the right eye. The signal in each eye travels down their respective optic nerves to the optic chiasm where the lateral retinal signal on the right continues down the right optic tract and the medial retinal signal on the left crosses midline and also travels down the right optic tract. With the entire left visual field information now in the right optic tract and lateral geniculate nucleus, the signal is relayed to the optic radiations and the entire left visual field information is interpreted by the right visual cortex as depicted by the purple coloration. Since we now know that the occiput is supplied solely by the terminal branch of the posterior circulation or the posterior cerebral artery, an abrupt loss of the right or left visual field can be the first sign of a posterior circulation stroke. If left untreated, the vascular occlusion can propagate proximally into the critical areas of the basilar artery, occluding the cerebellar branches resulting in discoordination and dysarthria or slurred speech. Worse yet, the perforator branches of the basilar artery can also occlude, starving the critical areas of the pons and brainstem of their blood supply. Since these areas control basic autonomic functions like respiration, heart rate, blood pressure, and digestion, these patients can stop breathing, have really high or really low heart rates and blood pressure, or may even vomit. Okay, Lots of information, but hopefully you now have a better understanding of the signs and symptoms of a stroke involving the various vascular territories of the brain. Remember, in stroke therapy, time is literally brain. These are the three things I want you to take away. Number one, recognize the signs and symptoms of a stroke. Number two, don't wait to see if things get better. Call 911 and when they arrive, number three, if available in your area, insist on being transported to the nearest comprehensive stroke center to access the most advanced stroke therapy equipment and personnel. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.